Hello, everyone. Welcome to our Eye Care Genetics Case Conference for Thursday, October 12th. I'm Tua Pal and really excited about this case conference. So really quick for eye care referrals, our top recruitment sites are um, of September 2023, Advocate, Good Shepherd in Barrington, Illinois, uh, Penn State in Pennsylvania, and then Adventist Health in California, in conjunction with Rutgers. And then you can see our top recruitment sites, as well as our uh, top case conference attendee sites. And super easy to uh, refer to eye care either directly through the website or through prepaid postcards that we can send you. And um, additionally, please keep submitting cases for presentation to our case conference, because again, this is a great way, we hope, to be able to get expert feedback and a great discussion across the group. Some eye care focused efforts, we're continuing to collaborate with Drs. Metcalf and Nayrod in Toronto on our hereditary breast cancer treatment study, looking at outcomes for females with PELB2, ATM, and CHECK2. Continue to collaborate with uh, Dr. Tishkowitz and team on PELB2 related efforts. And then alongside my colleague, Dr. Sonia Reed, we are doing a genomics study looking at specifically at breast tumors uh, from BRCA1 and two carriers, PELB2, ATM, and CHECK2. So please continue referring uh, your patients. And then with our impact study, we are continuing to actively accrue to this clinical trial looking at management, you know, different strategies to improve the management or uh, to um, enhance management of individuals with uh, inherited cancer predisposition, as well as family communication. Uh, just to highlight, we are very active on social media. Uh, you will see this is actually the one of the visuals that we had made for check two, which will kind of feed into our case conference theme for this month. And again, you can see we had a worldwide collaboration for this. So we publicize talks available, whether it's our own or others, newsletters, open studies, uh, educational stories, research updates, as well as guideline updates. So follow us if you would like. And then right before we get started, we did uh, for with the content of our uh, case conference this month, we did just release our newsletter. So hopefully you all received it. It is publicly accessible at our website. And um, uh, we did a review of the NCCN guideline updates, both for genetics familial breast ovarian pancreatic uh, guidelines, which were just released a few weeks ago, as well as the genetics familial uh, colorectal cancer guidelines. Uh, other guideline updates, there have been a lot of guideline updates, that um, some of which we reviewed in our newsletter, as well as cancer risk updates, treatment advances, ask, ask the expert, and then our community spotlight and active research efforts. So with that, I am going to go ahead and turn it over to Brenda to present our first case. Thank you. Yeah, so this is a 20, 28 now, 28 year old with a family history of BRCA1 mutation. So um, she came in saying that her maternal grandmother had a BRCA1 mutation. Um, she, the grandmother had breast cancer at 50, and then there was other more distant family history of breast cancer, but not even the grandmother had a copy of the, the genetic test report as it's often the case. And so it was just by report. Um, her mother had ovarian cancer at 45, but she had not had genetic testing. I can't quite recall if mother was not interested, but mother's still living. And so we focused our conversation on BRCA1, um, assuming that this was true. And so to my surprise, um, this patient did not have a B had that check to moderate risk variant, the I157T. Um, and so, you know, it was great news for her, but now I had to counsel her on this new moderate risk mutation. Um, and so, 
is you know as you guys know this is a moderate risk allele and so or mutation and so in the past um you know patients were counseled to have an increased risk of breast cancer even if in those that had it if a, this particular increased risk variant um and so in in our clinic we use we're using can risk to calculate people's breast and ovarian cancer risk in inclusion of their mutation but for this particular one um you know we can include this check two variant in can risk uh, because can risk uses a typical check two mutations and not the the low risk allele and so based on family history and other personal risk factors her lifetime risk of breast cancer was 16.3 so it's not above that 20 percent threshold and so increased breast cancer screening is not indicated for this patient and if you go to NCCN, now there is a particular, you know, there, there is a note about this particular variant saying that most missense variants are unclear, but some of pathogenic, likely pathogenic variants, such as the I157T, the risk for breast cancer appears to be lower. And so breast cancer screening should not be based on this variant, and it should be managed based on family history. And then furthermore, um, you know, the ACMG practice resource that was recently published, uh, which, you know, Dr. Helen Hansen is going to talk about, um, about, and then, you know, you have Doug Stewart, Dr. Tua Powell, Mark, Mark Tishkowitz, that contributed to this paper. They, uh, it, it goes through all, you know, they review all the different studies that, um, that have, um, you know, all the different risks associated with check two, moderate risk, high risk. And so according to the ACMG practice resources, this is not an actionable mutation for breast cancer screening in isolation. And so again, consistent with MCCN managed based on family history. However, for colon cancer, there is a slight increased risk. Um, I think it's like 1.5 to two fold increase, which is still below 10%, but NCCN recommends increased cancer screening for colorectal through colonoscopy starting at 40 or 10 years younger than the earliest diagnosis in the family and repeat every five years, which um, if I'm not mistaken, that's the same as if you had a first degree relative with colon cancer. So essentially having this variant does not, you know, colon cancer. Um, and so essentially we're managing these people based on family history. Okay. Well, thank you, Brenda. Uh, I think there might be some people that are having uh, technical difficulties joining the call. I do see that there are a number of people on the call, but our guest expert, Dr. Stewart, has been trying to join for the last 15 minutes and is getting an error message. So with that, I'm just going to go ahead and introduce both um, doctors, Helen Hansen and uh, Dr. Doug Stewart. So Dr. Hansen is a consultant in genetics at the Royal Devon University Healthcare NHS Foundation Trust, Exeter, UK. I think she just moved there recently from another facility and she is a an NIHR Senior Investigator Fellow, Faculty of Health and Life Sciences, University of Exeter, UK. Uh, Dr. Stewart is a Senior Investigator in the Clinical Genetics Branch in the Division of Cancer Epidemiology and Genetics at the NCI. I've had the pleasure of working closely with both of them uh, on a number of guidelines that we have developed and are in the process of developing with CHECK2 being the one that we released a few months ago. It's been ready for a while, but it took a while to get out there. And this was one that uh, Dr. Stewart and Dr. Hansen led. So with that, I'm going to pass it over to Dr. Hansen until we can work out what is going on with Dr. Stewart and his <laughs> error message. Okay. Uh, so, so thank you. So yes, I, I think I'm probably just have to wing it slightly until, <laughs> until Doug joins. So Doug was going to talk everyone through the slides and I was going to lead on the uh, case studies. Um, but, but I think, you know, the, the, this, the slides really are a run through of, of the paper and, you know, it, it's, 
not very exciting, um, lots of the statistics we've got. So I think probably the most interesting thing is the cases. So we'll go through the slides quite quickly and then uh, get to the cases. But maybe if um, Doug joins, then um, you can um, jump in and let me know. So as um, Troy says, I'm a cancer geneticist in the UK um, and um, I've had the pleasure of working with this um, ACMG, uh, ACMG group um, over the past couple of years on this um, clinical practice resource for individuals with CHET2 germline pathogenic variants. Um, and so um, one of the, the um, studies on CHECK2 was, was um, undertaken in uh, Denmark in the Copenhagen General Population Study. And this was a really um, definitive study and they um, looked at uh, their extensive cancer registries um, and studied um, a whole host of cancers that had potentially been associated with CHECK2. Um, and you can see that there is a whole list of cancers and I'll jump to the next slide, which shows um, it a, a little uh, more clearly that ones with the open circles are ones that had previously been associated with CHECK2, so um, uh, breast cancer, um, but then all of the other cancers were cancers which maybe previously hadn't been closely associated. Um, and what they showed was that actually um, CHECK2 probably is a multi tumor predisposition gene, but, can, but for uh, cancers other than breast cancer, the risk is, is probably at a very low level. Um, there were some anomalies, so you can see um, the stomach cancer um, was shown to have um, an association, but actually when you drill down to the numbers, there was only a very small number of cases with stomach cancer included. Um, and importantly to note that actually a number of these associations, when they perform some additional statistical analysis, um, that not all of these achieved association. But, but again, what they really showed was that um, CHECK2 was recognised as a low to moderate risk tumour predisposition gene. Um, so, um, you know, because there has been so many studies over the years which have linked CHECK2 to different cancers, and the risks have really been differently reported by different studies. There has been such um, a large amount of, I think, complexity and uncertainty about what we do in clinical practice and how we manage patients who have pathogenic variants um, in CHECK2. Um, and it's been in, it's sort of increasingly more important because as CHECK2 has been added to panels and we are starting to see more and more cases come through, there's been this real clinical need to know what to do in, in our clinical practice, as was, was highlighted by the first case. Um, so uh, this group of us have got together and really looked at the literature in detail and, and, and come up with um, some, you know, guidance on, on what to do in clinical practice. So um, to summarise um, what is in the paper, we um, we, we went through and we separated out um, truncating and missense variants because there does seem to be different risks associated with um, truncating and uh, missense for the different cancers. So um, we looked at things which we felt we you know, clearly could use in clinical practice. So, you know, where we, we had more confidence in saying that there was a clear association. So um, in terms of truncating variants, um, it's clear that there is um, an association with breast cancer, um, but we would look at truncating variants, um, again, alongside a personalised assessment, looking at other factors such as family history. Um, and we would consider that um, truncating variants have a, um, a moderate um, association with breast cancer, so a relative risk of around between two and four. Missense variants, and, and we are not talking here about the I157T or the S428F variants here. Most other missense variants have a low to moderate risk, so a relative risk of around 1.5 to to two, um, but there are some exceptions. So if you look in the paper, there are 117G does seem to have um, a risk that's equivalent to truncating variants. And so we would likely treat that variant in the same group as truncating variants. Um, but then the missense variants I157T and S428F actually seem to be low risk. And so they have um, a relative risk of about one to 1 1.5, which, you know, is the same sort of level of risk as, um, uh, you know, a polymorphism. So really low. Um, so there is an association, but very low risk. And then in terms of Breast cancer um, for males, we can see um, that there is a moderate risk, a so relative risk of two or greater. Um, so, so we looked at breast cancer and split that down in, into the different um, groups. 
And then for the other check to associated cancers, we felt that really, um, other than for colon and prostate, the, the, the studies um, are still quite conflicting um, and, and limited. So, we, so we, we pull out colon and prostate in the paper. Um, we say for um, truncating variants, there is a low to moderate risk of um, colorectal cancer. Um, and again, for missense variants, um, the, uh, there is a low um, association with colorectal cancer. So, so we're managing really in the context of family history. Um, and similar for prostate, there appears to be a moderate association for truncating variants, but the risks are much less clear for, um, for, for missense variants. And for all other cancers, we, we felt the risks were much less clear. So just sort of going through that in, in, in a little bit more detail. So for in these slides are you know very busy, so we won't go through them in 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 huge detail. But for trunca tr truncating check two variants, um, that there are is clear um, evidence from the studies that are available. So the um, carriers and bridges studies, um, where the, there is an association with an odds ratio of greater than two for for truncating variants, um, and is a little bit higher for the um, eleven hundred del C variant. But for missense variants, the risk really um, for these common check two variants, um, I157T and um, S428F is, is really um, you know, much lower. So odds ratios of 1.3 and 1.26 from those studies. Whereas rare missense variants in check two have an odds ratio about 1.5. And there was another paper published by um, the Dorling et al. Um, a year later than this, which did try and separate out the missense variants in a bit more detail. And again, it's clear that there probably are some missense variants that are associated with slightly higher risk. Um, but it, you know, still most of them seem to be um, have an odds ratio of less than two. Then in terms of contralateral breast cancer, um, again, the studies do um, seem to suggest that overall there is an increased risk for um, contralateral um, breast cancer. Um, so women who have been affected with Wands cancer um, do have um, an increased risk of a, of a contralateral cancer. And then in terms of um, male breast cancer, again, there does um, the studies are suggesting that um, check two truncating variants are associated with an increased risk. So you can see from a Finnish study, the odds ratio is around four. Um, and then another um, study from the US, um, again, demonstrating um, odds ratios of between um, two and four. So then moving on. So then in terms of other adult cancer risk, I think one of the things we wanted to really uh, clearly make clear from this paper is that CHECK2 is not a cause of Lee-Fraumeni syndrome. And this has um, been an unfortunate um, association going back to a, a paper from many years ago where um, CHECK2 was proposed to be associated with um, Lee-Fraumeni syndrome in a family, but actually um, really the was associated with the breast cancer in the in the reported family um, and so check two is is does not cause Lee Faramani syndrome um, and, but unfortunately this still appears on many reports and I think um, you know is, is something that's been very hard to get rid of so we really call out in the paper that um, you know these these things should not be in the same sentence together um, and then, as I've mentioned, you know, other than the breast, colorectal and prostate, there is some evidence of association of CHECK2 with other cancers, um, but the risks are much less clear. Um, and it's really hard to tease out because the studies are limited by either ascertainment bias or, or small numbers. And so we didn't feel, um, reviewing this within the expert group, that actually we could make recommendations for any of these um, cancers because there is still um, some uncertainty. And, and obviously things will change and there is emerging um, data for, for some of these cancers. Um, uh, and also uh, there, there is some reports about potentially decreased decrease ris risks of lung cancer. So again, you know, varying um, information. Uh, and the other thing we pulled out was that there's no increased risk of ovarian cancer. And um, so there's no evidence of association for ovarian cancer. So we could be um, clear about that. And then um, in terms of biallelic check two, um, so uh, it does, seem again the studies are quite small and um, but it does seem that there is an increased risk um, of uh, breast cancer if somebody has biallelic check 2 pathogenic variants 
um, and we um, the studies are estimating that the risk is probably double that um, of um, heterozygotes, so at least 40% lifetime risk or greater. Um, and interestingly, there's a few papers that we pull out in the in in um, the practice resource about um, some the, the, the certain variants. There seems to be um, a phenotype um, associated with, with chromosome instability, but that doesn't doesn't seem to be true for all biallelic um, carriers. So again, probably more information is is needed on um, biallelic um, carriers going forward. Um, but the risks do suggest that maybe we should be treating um, these women differently um, than if they were um, heterozygous carriers. Um, and then um, in terms of paediatric cancers, so there have has been some studies which have shown a, a, an association of CHECK2 variants with paediatric tumor, tumor risk. Um, but again, um, you know, overall, that there, there doesn't seem to be strong evidence that um, germline check to um, variants are associated with an increased risk of paediatric cancer. Um, and, um, you know, exome sequencing studies have not shown any significant um, increased numbers of, of check to carriers with, with, within those studies. So at the moment, um, although there has been you know, some reports of an association, we wouldn't consider check two as having a significantly increased risk of any um, paediatric cancer. So where does that all leave us in terms of um, clinical actionability? Well, again, to emphasize check two is not associated with leaf romani syndrome. Um, we um, would say that CHECK2 is established as a moderate risk breast cancer predisposition allele. Um, but even when you have a truncating variant, there is a significant impact of other factors um, such as family history. And therefore, how you manage that patient in your clinical practice should really still consider all of those other factors and not just that CHECK2 variant. So we, we still should be looking at a personalized risk assessment and using a tool such as CAN risk is incredibly helpful because you can incorporate information about their hormonal um, risk factors, their family history, as well as their genetic test result. But at the moment, um, you can only um, input into CAN risk um, check to carriers who have truncating variants. In terms of um, colorectal cancer and prostate cancer, then there does seem to be an association, um, but more of a low to moderate association. So if we would advise managing that patient in the context of their um, family history. Um, and then for other cancers, we felt that there was currently insufficient evidence to support any um, change in clinical management um, for cancers such as renal or thyroid or um, hematological tumours. So um, what do we do? So um, as I've mentioned before, and we know that family history um, influences risk in, in check two heterozygotes, just as it does in anyone in the um, population. We know that PRS scores can have an impact, although we're not widely using these in, in clinical um, practice um, at present. Um, but the use of uh, a tool such as CAMRISC um, can really help guide our consultations with patients. So it shouldn't replace our clinical judgment, but it can really help um, provide some estimates. And I think some of the cases have got some CAMRISC examples in. You know, again, we, we, we discuss polygenic risk scores in the paper. And at the moment, um, you know, we know that they have an impact in the setting of breast cancer, but in terms of other cancers, um, then there's very little information. So we don't know how that, that um, risk might be modified um, by PRS scores for, for other cancers, such as colorectal or prostate. Um, and you can't use CAN risk or a similar tool such as CAN risk for those um, variants. So, um, just to re-emphasize that um, can risk um, is really helpful for individuals who have truncating variants um, and um, should be used to help guide recommendations for surveillance and also um, risk reducing surgery. Um, but for, at the moment for colorectal and prostate cancer, because we have no similar tools such as can risk, um, then we would um, really just look at, at the family history as, as the, the main guide to how we should manage these families. If we have individuals who have missense variants, then we can't use um, CAN risk, but we know that the risks are likely to be much lower than for truncating variants. And so we would advise in these situations that we just manage the patient um, on, on the family history and not um, that genetic test result. Um, and the I-157T and the uh, 
the um, S48 um, F variant are associated with lower risk, so really a sort of relative risk of 1 to 1.5. Um, so in isolation, it would be difficult to change management. So that's um, a run through of some of the data, and hopefully that will help us answer some of the questions, uh, some of the, the cases um, going forward. Okay, so thank you so much, Helen. And I know that Doug is now on the phone and the Zoom. Okay. <laughs> Continued. Uh, something's going on with uh, the link. We're not sure what, but he's on. Okay. So we will go through the cases. I know, uh, as I'd mentioned before, we have Brenda's case. I kind of wanted to talk through all three of our cases with the I-157T together. So our next presenter is Crystal. So uh, Crystal Turner is uh, at Oregon Health and Science University in Portland, Oregon, and she will be presenting our second case. Crystal, all right. It. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate this opportunity. Um, as I was introduced, I'm Crystal Turner. I'm a physician assistant and I run the high risk breast cancer screening clinic at the Oregon Health and Science University in Portland, Oregon. So um, in alignment with this, uh, you know, the missense variant, I thought we could get into one of my particular patients. Um, so she was sent for a consultation to the high risk screening clinic. Uh, she's a 54-year-old woman who was diagnosed with multifocal left breast cancer about 10 years ago when she was age 44. Um, her disease involved actually having two tumors that were uh, rather kind of moderate, moderate to larger sized, um, and it was invasive ductal carcinoma, and it was ERPR positive and HER2 negative, uh, and she had no lymph node involvement. So she was treated with neoadjuvant chemotherapy, uh, unilateral mastectomy. Uh, she did have some residual uh, tumor at the time. And then adjuvant tamoxifen, um, radiation wasn't uh, indicated. So at the time of her diagnosis 10 years ago, she had kind of very limited genetic testing. Um, she just had BRCA1 and BRCA2 testing that was negative. And at the time, she did not have family history of breast cancer. She was the first to be diagnosed with breast cancer. Um, she came, uh, you know, so it's been 10 years of survivorship with no recurrence, but she presented this year uh, stating that her mother at age 76 was recently diagnosed with uh, a similar like multifocal breast cancer. She had three separate tumors, uh, one being a more aggressive tumor being a triple negative. And her mother's genetic testing revealed that kind of low penetrance, um, the, the infamous I157T um, mutation, along with some other uh, mutations as well. So we'll get to those. So this prompted the patient to get retested. Here's a pedigree. Um, so we'll go to the patient. Um, who is here. So her mother being diagnosed with breast cancer. The patient's had some skin cancer. She has a, a sister who's had some skin cancer. Um, and then there, it looks to be like some prostate cancer on the paternal lineage, but really just the patient and her mother having, uh, having had breast cancer. And these are the genetic profiles. Um, the top one is the patient's mother's testing. She had a 87 gene panel um, and she came positive for the check two, the, the I-157, but there's a variety of other mutations as well, including some variants of unknown significance. The patient um, had a 49 gene panel performed uh, and she has the check two, uh, the same as her mother, the I-157. Um, and then she also has a RAD50 uh, gene mutation. So my question, you know, if we're, we're ignoring the, uh, the I-157 variant, can we still interpret this patient as having an increased risk um, based on her personal history of breast cancer, her family history of breast cancer? She had a very young age at her diagnosis. She was under age 50. Uh, she had multifocal disease, so multiple tumors in her breast, and she does have extremely dense breast tissue on her mammogram of her remaining breast. Um, so, so we have been just screening her once a year with a, a mammogram on the remaining breast, but my question is, should we implement uh, adding in the breast MRI? 
Um, should she explore a risk-reducing mastectomy of the re remaining breast? And do we in incorporate her having five years of adjuvant tamoxifen into the decision-making um, since she really has reduced her risk for breast cancer in the remaining breast tissue? So I appreciate any input that we can um, have on this discussion. Thank you, Crystal. I think Doug is able to unmute himself. Doug, we know you're out there. Helen, do you want to Sorry, comment? Can you, hear, can you hear me now? Yeah, so, oh my God, we're so excited. Yes, we can hear you. Oh my word, this has been such an epic. Anyhow, I apologize. I've never had so many problems with the uh, Zoom ever. Um, anyhow, so um, we had originally divided this up so that I would present the slides. I saw that Helen did a, a good job of that, and she was going to take the lead on the case discussion. So um, um, I'll, I'll let her lead off with the comments on this case, and then we, we had discussed them before and can certainly weigh in as appropriate. Um, th thanks, Doug. I'm glad you made it, made it in the end. So um, the... Um, so I, I guess I was firstly just going to comment that in just, you know, from a UK perspective, we do not even report the I-157T variant. So I just I think that may be in, of interest to the audience. So in terms of check two, we would only report back truncating variants. And that's because um, we we tend to we would report back things we feel are clinically actionable um, roughly with an odds ratio um, of two or greater. Um, so. Um, you know, but obviously we do see um, people who have had testing through private companies or from overseas, um, but we don't um, use this in, the, in in our clinical management. Um, so I, you know, I, we wouldn't consider that um, in our assessment, but all of the things that you mentioned, um, you know, we would consider um, the dense breast, the family history, um, and you're completely right that having the um, tamoxifen has likely um, reduced the risk, but there, unfortunately, you know, we can't integrate that information to a CAN risk assessment. So, so um, whilst I've been advocating use of CAN risk in certain situations, this is a tricky situation. So the, the tricky situation we find is when we're trying to estimate contralateral risk because you can't take into consideration those competing um, risks and, and treatments from the, from the, um, from the primary diagnosis. Um, so I, I think, you know, your your questions have almost a answered um, <laughs> the, the points in that, you you know, I think we would take all of those factors into consideration. Um, you know, she has a number of risk factors in terms of um, risk reducing mastectomy. And again, you know, our practice is probably a bit different in the UK. We um, tend, you know, it, we say if somebody's lifetime risk is greater than 30 percent, then that would be at a level which we might consider, you know, having a discussion. Um, I don't know if you have a similar threshold um, in, in, in the US, um, but we um, tend to have a bit of a higher threshold for, for MRI um, screening. So I don't think I can sort of comment on those specifics, but I think, you know, your approach it sounds very valid and maybe and Toya can comment on the country specific sort of um, recommendations in terms of, you know, thresholds for for MRI or surgery. Yeah, I, I mean, the, the problem, Helen kind of hit on it, that it's going to be hard from, like, you can't even use can risk per se with this variant, right? Because the variant is lower risk than what is inputted into the model that kind of powers can risk. It's really for the typical trunk, the truncating check two mutations. So I think clinical judgment here as <laughs> you're using would be what would the way to go because there's there's really not anything per guidelines like you can't follow you can't think of this the same way you would a truncating check too. I think that's kind of the bottom line, which is what you're doing. Um, Helen, I was also wondering, do you have any comments on Brenda's case? Because then we have Bushra's case, which is, again, yes. along the same theme. Yes. Um, so, uh, yes. And that, so that was um, the case where we the I-157T variant had, had been identified. In, but we, um, I think that one, I was just wondering, um, that was where the grandmother was known to have a BRCA1 um, 
variant, but no further information was available. But the, we we weren't certain whether the mum with ovarian cancer also had that BRCA1 uh, variant, I think, which would obviously be very helpful because if we could um if, if we could know that then we could really we could be much more reassuring i think to um brenda's patient um i think um in in terms of the risk assessments so there so the the can risk assessment showed a, around about 16 percent lifetime risk um so i think that fell but below your threshold for increased um screening but uh, you know maybe considering things like breast density and um, would would be helpful in that situation if you've got access to that um and you know this is where you know, in the future you know prs schools could make a difference if you had access to that it may push people slightly you know above that level or or, or decrease it so um i think it's important to remember that you know can risk is only based on the assess that the information you put in and so it's it, you know unless you've put in every single piece of information um you know it's still you know, there's still probably confidence intervals around that that um, that that figure that you get out. Um, I can't remember now what the other questions were on um, Brenda's case. Well, Brenda also had another question here in the mm -hmm. chat. Mm -hmm. um, this is oh, oh, yeah. impact colorectal cancer screening mm -hmm. here in the US. Uh, mm -hmm. Colonoscopy five years earlier than general population repeat every five years. <laughs> um, how does that compare? Yeah. so again so we so again we don't we we don't report um the missense variants we only report truncating variants so we so if we if that person had had testing in the uk we wouldn't know if they had a missense variant um i think our surveillance for colorectal cancer is probably a, again a bit different so we if for a moderate risk family history um we follow our british society of gastroenterology guidelines which actually is just one off colonoscopy at 55 and then we have population screening with fit testing um, from the age of 60 every two years so I think our moderate risk screening is probably less than than your um, population screening um, and then we would offer five yearly um, colonoscopy um, for a higher risk um, family history um, you know having excluded things like Lynch syndrome um, or FAP. Great let's go on to Bushra's case and then we can keep talking a few more minutes about um, this. So uh, Bushra, take it away. Bushra Ziki is a um, inherited cancer specialist at Ohio Health, I think coming from primary care initially, but very knowledgeable about inherited cancer and staffs the high risk service or leads the high risk service there. Bushra, take it away. Thank you, Tia. Thanks for the generous introduction. Um, yeah, just a comment I meant I wanted to make on the previous patient who actually is a cancer survivor and has dense breast. And uh, so she actually just meets criteria purely because of her dense breast to get annual breast MRI screenings along with um, annual mammograms. And uh, based on her personal history, that's an additional bonus point going forward. So just two cents up there. So I have this patient um, and um, she is a 41 year old um, and had right breast cancer, invasive ductal, uh, which was hormone positive and she was only 40 years old. Um, so she, because of her young age, she went ahead and had genetic testing. Um, which kind of, you know, revealed our uh, I-157T mutation. Interestingly, um, you know, when we look at the pedigree, um, so she at that point was uh, told that, you know, cascade testing should uh, be done on all family members. So essentially her siblings and her father um, went ahead and had genetic testing um, and they were all positive for the same uh, variant. So looking at her pedigree, I mean, there's nothing um, suggestive of really breast cancer other than our proband who came to see us. Uh, there's some multiple myeloma and non-Hodgkin's, but yeah, no prostate, no uh, colon, no breast. Um, so so um, her question was that, you know, so going forward, um, obviously when we started talking about um, um, the low risk with this particular missense uh, uh, mutation. Um, it was interesting how different um, um, 
you know, different information was being circulated and, uh, and her sister was being told she needed to start getting um, high risk screenings and uh, patient herself was uh, informed that she would probably qualify for risk reducing mastectomy and, uh, and so her father, I mean, like it was a whole slur of, okay, how should we manage this patient and how should we manage, um, you know, the rest of the family. So we wanted to just, you know, get a general discussion started on what do we do in, in these patients who've already, you know, had, the family has had cascade testing and, uh, um, you know, how aggressive do we need to get and what would be her siblings risk uh, going forward. Thank you. So I think I think your case probably really highlights um, it, that there's probably a lot um, about how we communicate these risks to, to families and how we discuss these different variants and, and also the information that's on the lab reports and um, that we receive. So um, I think it's tricky, um, you know, if people have been counselled that that this is the cause of breast cancer in the family and it, this is associated with a high risk. But I, I think, um, you know, we, we should be viewing um, this specific variant as a risk factor um, along with, you know, all of the other risk factors. And so it's not something that is acting in isolation um, to, you know, to cause the breast cancer. I don't, you know, I don't, this is not the only reason I, I'm sure that this um, patient has developed breast cancer um, at 40. So I think it's um, really thinking about how we um, discuss these results um, with patients and uh, and explain that this, you know, in isolation isn't, isn't sufficient to, to alter management. And, uh, you know, in, in the in the UK, we would offer um, increased breast screening on the basis of the family history, um, you know, with a, um, one person who's been diagnosed at um, uh, under 40, then they would get some increased breast screening, but that we wouldn't be recommending anything more on, on the um, I-157T variant. And, and again, we wouldn't, you know, because we don't report this, then we don't have this, um, I guess, this situation. So I see Georgia's hand up, Georgia. Hi everybody. Um, this is real. Uh, these cases are just fascinating, and um, thank you so much for bringing them uh, to the group. My general comment, being in the business for years and years and years, is people believe the lab tests more than they believe risk analysis. So if, and this is physicians, uh, uh, providers, and patients will go, oh, it's genetic. And therefore, that is something more important rather than um, really. This is this is a nothing burger. <laughs> you can't you can't you can't you know um, really develop a good management program based on that. But that is not what people hear. So I think that's our big task, and it's just my my general comment of what do people hear? How much do we try to how much do we try to guide them? And then Helen, I totally agree. What is the family history telling you? There's a breast cancer, age 40, um, and therefore screening, you know, sh really should come uh, come off of that. But I, I just, I really worry that we're taking these variants that hardly do a thing on the population level, um, and in over, um, I guess, over prescribing uh, the the level of risk. Anyway. Over my hundred percent agree. Yeah, hundred percent agree. Okay. Um. You know, I do want. I know we only have fifteen minutes left, so let's go on to the next case. But this again, I I think is a fascinating case with you know that highlights this issue with the Czech I one five seven T variant. I was gonna go ahead and present this case on behalf of my colleague uh, Mariah who. Uh, Hubert, who is not here to, uh, for this case conference. She's a genetic counselor in our service. So here's the patient that Mariah saw, 26-year-old female presented for risk assessment. And her mother here had a check to an ATM mutation, as did the aunt. The mother was tested through Ambry, aunt was tested through Invitae. Found it interesting that with ATM, it said, up to full fourfold risk of breast cancer with check two up to twofold. I'm guessing that's because of the high risk 
ATM variant that they say, quote unquote, up to. But again, from a patient standpoint, that could be really confusing. Um, the maternal aunt, like I already said, had the same mutation as well. And you can see here, the mother had breast cancer, or the proband's mother had breast cancer at age 56, currently age 56. And then uh, her sister had breast cancer at age 56, currently age 60. And then there was the maternal grandmother who'd had breast cancer at age 55, lived to uh, age 95. And then here there's a cervical cancer um, in another sister and then a brother. So what I did here is uh, we didn't have, the patient was still thinking, the proband was still thinking about getting um, tested. So at the time that Mariah had presented this case, she was still thinking about it. But I ran can risk, so I'd love your interpretation of this, Helen, um, in different scenarios. And I found it interesting, like I just found the exercise pretty interesting. So with the probin untested and both the like the family history, so grandmother with breast cancer, mother with breast cancer, aunt with breast cancer, with a mother and aunts both being double heterozygous, right? For check two and ATM. Um the risk I got to age 80 was up to 32.8%. Then when I did just check two, lifetime risk that I got was 41.7. With ATM, <laughs> the lifetime risk I got was 42.4. And then when they were negative, it actually did go down, 23.8. Um, I actually ran it, I didn't put it on the screen, but I also ran it as a double heterozygote in the proband, and I got the exact same risk as I did with check two, like identical. So, which again tells us that I don't think there's any way to account for double heterozygotes. Well, in practice, there isn't either, right? Like there's no risk model that exists for this. And then the other thing I found that was interesting was ovarian cancer risk was 3.3% in all of these scenarios, which was a little strange to me because ATM, we have a higher risk for ovarian cancer, but with check two, we don't. And I wish Mark Tishkowitz was on this call. I don't think he is, but <laughs> Helen, <laughs> yeah, you can kind of pinch um, for Mark. Yeah. Um, so, so I can answer, so the ovarian cancer risk, I, I can answer this. So when um, can risk is calculating um, ovarian cancer risk, um, obviously it takes in information on the family history, um, hormonal factors, but in terms of genetic uh, results, it doesn't include uh, check to an ATM in its risk assessment. So, so um, if you there's a helpful if you go, go on the CANRIS page and there's a sort of um, FAQ bit. But in in terms of its ovarian cancer risk model, it's not uh, ATM and check to are not contributing to the overall risk. So that's why it's coming out at the same level for each of these um, scenarios. Um, and that is just the way that the model is set up and the, what information it's using. That makes sense, yes. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, then I think, you know, you're right. There's no, we can't input uh, both check two and, and ATM um, and see if there's any um, additive effect. And, I, you know, looking at the available literature, I couldn't find anything you know, that, that would give any good figures. Um, Doug might want to jump in and I know he's, uh, uh, you know, been looking at this a bit, um, uh, but, you know, certainly there's, no, you know, there isn't anything good. You might, you know, propose that there is some additive effect, but there isn't anything concrete to, to support that. Um, and then I think the reason that the, the lifetime risks or the residual risk between 28 and 80 is coming out as, as similar for check two and ATM is because, again, the CANRIS model is using uh, mainly the data from the Bridges paper. And I think in that the odds, you know, the, uh, the odds ratios were similar for ATM and check two, uh, I mean, two point something, I can't remember exactly what, but so that's probably why those risks are coming out similar for check two and, and ATM. Um, I guess what's interesting is that, um, you know, the sort of looking at the untested and then the um, tested and negative, then, you know, there's still in the, you know, where she hasn't inherited either of those variants, then the risk is still 
higher, you know, presumably based on the family family history. Um, uh, but I think it is helpful, you know, if you are using can risk, it is helpful to to look and run all these different scenarios and see um, the different impact and how and how that you know impacts on um, risk for an individual. Yeah, yeah. we um, Helen and I enjoyed sort of reviewing this and thought the the can risk results that you you got there too were interest you know fascinating and you know it's not 100 percent clear what the total risk is if this patient had both the check two and the ATM variants but presumably it's not additive but some sort of sort of synergistic in some way when pop, wouldn't, wouldn't be surprised if it popped that risk um, above the 42 percent that you see there um, we have a couple of active program where we're looking at check two variants in a that are genomically ascertained and then there is a, um, a this is using data from the uh, UK Biobank and, and also our Geisinger cohort. There are um, you know, several thousand individuals who harbor those uh, check two, uh, who are check two heterozygotes. And there are, I would say, several dozen individuals in that group who also harbor an ATM or a BRCA1 or BRCA2, um, PALB2 variant. And we're looking carefully to see what kind of cancers, if any, those individuals who are, have sort of two hits, if you will, in two different genes. The numbers are very small, uh, so it's sort of descriptive statistics. Uh, you can also look at bioallelics, too, for all those genes, genes including CHECK2. Um, but I would be optimistic that as these sequencing cohorts get larger and larger, we'd see more and more data like that as we realize that these these folks who walk around with multiple variants, multiple pathogenic variants, are, are not as rare as we had previously thought. And I wanted to, uh, Dr. Brittany uh, Bichkovsky from um, the Boston area, so from the Harvard system, is on the call. She's a medonc. Brittany, are you? I, I'm here. Yeah, I'm happy happy to chat. Yes, um, please. Yeah, so I would say in regards to, you know, this patient's family who has multiple mu mutations, one in ATM and CHECK2, is that correct? Yes. I have seen some data um, that may suggest, and we actually had a poster on this um, at ASCO a couple years ago, um, that that combination may increase the chance of having a breast cancer diagnosis at younger ages. So our group has had internal discussions about this. And for that combination, we recommend starting breast cancer screening at a younger age, more likely like 25, similar to BRCA1 and BRCA2. That's interesting because we start now in the U.S. between 30 to 35. So you'd reduce that by another five years. And these are for truncating, well, I guess for... Check two, it would be the truncating mutations. Well, we we manage the low risk check two variants differently than the truncating in the missense check two variants. Okay. Because we think that some of those missense check two variants are more similar to like 1100 Del C. Right, and ATM is a whole other ball game too. Yeah, has a similar sort of situation. But we are managing kind of the low risk variants because they um, come through on our testing here in the United States. We see all the low risk variants: I one fifty seven T, S four twenty eight F, and T four seventy six M. We see patients who have those results, and we manage them. Um, considering their family history of cancer. Perfect. Thank you. And then we have um, some other comments in the chat. One of them is um, the comment, which I agree with. A number of labs have unfortunately not yet changed slash updated their test reports for the I-157T variant. And as all of us in the U.S. know, there's not necessarily consistency in reporting these variants as well. They can be reported as a VUS, risk allele, you know, lower penetrance variant. So it's all over the board with that one. Um, here, I'm looking at these other comments. Would you consider risk-reducing mastectomy in double heterozygotes, including check a truncating CHECK2 variant and a second moderate penetrant 
breast cancer gene. Brittany, if you're not, uh, if you're still unmuted, I'd like for you to take this one on because I mean, it's a double. <laughs> yeah, um, yes, we would. Um, I think these are really personal decisions for the patients. I don't think anyone has to have a preventative mastectomy, but it is an option that we talk about with our patients um, who have strongly penetrant genes like BRCA1, BRCA2, TP53. And then I think for patients, even with a monolytic check 2 pathogenic variant, um, it's an option for them too, particularly if they have a family history. Um, and so I think with like the combination of check 2 pathogenic variant plus an ATM pathogenic variant, I um, definitely think that that's an option for those patients. Yeah, no, I would agree with that. And even with these, again, the CANRIS models are just models and models are not perfect, but they can be helpful. So that can also refine how we're thinking about it sometimes as well. I wanted to go on to the next case because that uh, this case, we're only going to have time to do this next case. Can uh, I just make one comment? Yeah. Just could you go back to the the uh, analysis? That, oh, I'm sorry. I've got to leave. I can't make my comment. I'll okay. try to send it later. Sorry. <laughs> That's okay, Georgia. Sorry. <laughs> Okay, so this uh, last case, I will try and do it really quickly. Uh, this was a patient I saw, 48-year-old female sister diagnosed with breast cancer, found to be check 2 positive. Uh, father was tested negative. The history is um, this patient was tested through the Invitae Health Screen, uh, recently identified as check 2 positive, but also had this MYBPC3 mutation referred to high risk uh, breast uh, screening clinic, um, patient and mother both had hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. So when I saw this result initially, again, with the health screen, you get beyond just cancer genes, but she already knew about that. So that was um, not a surprise. So here you see the family history. I'd initially seen her sister and then I saw um, the proband afterwards. So she's got the 1100 del C mutation. Now, here's the thing. I ran her can risk based on all, like, you know, her breast density, hormonal risk factors, lifestyle risk factors, et cetera. Um, absolute risk of breast cancer from current age over the next five years, 5.7%, next 10 years, 12.6%. And risk of developing breast cancer between 48 and 80 was almost 41% compared to average population risk. You see, definitely high. So, there are some things that are driving this high risk for breast cancer. I won't get into them in detail. But here's the thing. In the context of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, which this patient has, if she were to develop breast cancer, there would be risks of chemotherapy, cardiotoxicity, et cetera. And then tamoxifen chemo prevention, there's risks for blood clots and strokes. So risks that were seen with this patient are higher than what we typically see with check two mutations. So this was when I discussed with our team and risk reducing mastectomy was something, again, like Brittany said before, it's a choice, but it was something I brought up during the session as a potential option that she could consider. But I wanted to get other folks's take on this. I, I can chime in. I would definitely offer this patient a preventative mastectomy, but I think part of that would be getting a better sense of what is her perioperative risks and what would be her um, desire for reconstruction and her options for reconstruction. If she's someone who said, oh, if I'm going to have a preventative mastectomy, I want to have a flap reconstruction. <laughs> And that would put her at a very, very high risk of perioperative complications, then it's probably not the appropriate choice for her. But if she's someone who is like, yeah, I'm on board with having a preventative mastectomy, I don't want to have reconstruction, I'm happy with going flat, then that has obviously lower perioperative risks in comparison to someone who has a preventative mastectomy and wants to have autologous reconstruction. And then implants is obviously in between. Yeah, no, that makes a lot of sense. 
Any other comments? I know we're at time. I, I was just going to um, comment and say that this, I think, was a good example of, of how I, I don't think the family history was so strong here, but actually there's a, no, a number of other significant risk factors that seem to be pushing up her risk. And, and certainly from doing CAN risk assessments in lots of our CHEP2 um, heterozygotes, and there have been some people who ha it seems surprising how high their, um, you know, contralateral risk or, or in unaffected people, their um, lifetime risk was and so there, there are definitely situations as Brittany says where you know even for check two heterozygotes that you you may consider uh, risk reducing mastectomy because there are other things contributing um to risk in, in those patients and um, so I think this is a nice one to highlight those risk factors yeah and here I have yeah. the comment from Georgia that um so she was saying my comment on the last case where we did the multiple or I did the multiple can risk estimates check two and ATM curves were similar. So we have no evidence for additive effect. I don't think that's the case though. The no. thing is that's not factored in. So we can't assume one way or the other. I think the main message for that case was there is no additive effect. Yeah, they're similar, but can risk is not computing any sort of effect that's additive of course, across the two genes. Right, yeah. Ellen? Um, there, yes, right. so just a, a can risk. Uh, there was another comment saying about the residual risk of an undetected BRCA mutation. So I think again, just to highlight again another little quirk in can risk, you can look at the sensitivity um, settings because they're set to a default. And for BRCA one and BRCA two testing, they're assuming that the sensitivity of testing is actually only about eighty percent, which in today's technology, um, actually sensitivity is much higher than that. So you know ninety eight. 99% and so um, you can alter the sensitivity settings um, and then uh, you, you, which make then sometimes do alter the risk and bring the, the risk down so um, there's just these little nuances that I think the more you use can risk you you sort of identify um, and I know Antonis has spoken at this meeting a number of times so um, these are little things that crop up occasionally and um, we use it a lot more in the UK I think. Oh, and Georgia was clarifying, she was referring to the literature that hasn't shown an additive effect, which is true. And then I saw that Brittany put a link in the chat. And I think that's probably um, related to the abstract that they had at ASCO. Yeah, that's right. Perfect. No, that's really helpful. And we can send that out to the group afterwards as well. Um, would you recommend doing that typically for modern testing? I think that was relating to my altering the sensitivity. So I would, if, if somebody's had, um, you know, uh, testing recently, then I would change the sensitivity um, settings. And I do. Um, I mean, I, when Antonis like uh, did the eye care presentation, he said you could do the direct mutation testing. That would change it to 100%, right? Like that. So uh, yes, I guess uh, so. Uh, yes, I guess that's, <laughs> so that's, what I guess that's another way to do it. Yeah. I just do direct mutation yeah. to see yeah. my setting, and that way I don't have that issue. Um, Doug, you were going to say something. I, I would just a comment that uh, I thought this case nicely example a nice a nice example of uh, multiple multiple diagnoses as we, we talked in the previous example uh, previous case, and then just to go back to a comment you made to a. Uh, uh, which I would modify a little bit saying, um, you, I think you had said models aren't perfect. I would say, you know, all models are wrong, but some are useful and can, can risk. I think in discussing these cases with, with Helen to prepare our comments from today, clearly it can be a starting point for a conversation about risk. It doesn't perfectly capture everything, but it may give a sort of a, at least a minimal sense or a, a, a sense of a range of, of where people lie. So clearly more work needs to be done, but um, at least as a way to start a conversation. And it gives people a number and a figure, and, and I think people are responsive to that. Okay, so here's another question. Any discussion on NCCN guidelines for colon cancer versus the recommendation in the ACMG resource for check two? I might leave that one for you to ask <laughs> with your... End, <laughs> with your so um, we actually rely, I, I think with... Um, NCCN, at this point, they're reviewing the data. There's going to be new colon guidelines that come out. I know Georgia's on that panel, um, so they are actively reviewing it. Um, from the breast ovarian standpoint, we just defer to them. In the ACMG resource, what did we say, Helen? I'm just trying to remember. 
So we've just we've said really to manage on the basis of family history. So we are not taking into you know consideration the check two status. It's really you know family history and other risk factors. Um, and that's kind of, I mean, because I, I, the last time I looked at the Genetics Familial Colorectal Cancer Guidelines panel, there was a lot of leeway in terms, they were scaling back. It wasn't clear that you needed to do necessarily do more, but you could do more. So there, I don't think they're discrepant from my take of it. Yeah, we, we said in the ACMG paper for both truncating and missense variants, um, to offer surveillance as per family history and uh, yeah yeah so i have another uh, comment here recommendation is age 40 every five years uh 1100 del c and i 157 t um all i can say is i again i think we left leeway based on the uh, the data that we reviewed georgia would love your take on this well, I, I don't know that I have the best explanation, but um, I think the harmonization there was to fit it in in a risk pattern that is very similar to uh, family history. Um, and again, I think some of these recommendations were actually made before the main adjustment for everybody to start their screening at age 45. And so what I don't know is if that's going to alter any um, any of these specific screenings, but that's a great question um, to take back to the group. But I, but I believe it's really to kind of focus at what is the risk for family history, um, and and to and harmonize these particular uh, gene uh, variants with within that construct. Yeah, no, that makes a lot of sense. Thank you. All right, I think we are already, we are already over time. I apologize for that. So upcoming case conferences next month, our November case conference, we have um, uh, Bryce, uh, Bryce, uh, Bryson Cantona presenting on pancreatic cancer screening. So he will be our guest expert. So we're really excited about that. Please submit cases. And then for our December case conference, we have a panel discussion lined up, care for diverse, gender diverse individuals with or at risk for inherited cancer predisposition with guest experts, Sarah Roth, Sasha Weiss, and Kim Zahowski. So again, very, very excited about that. And we have a full agenda for next year. Again, if there's a topic that anyone wants to see us present, please let us know and we will try and make it happen. And with that, Thank you for attending. Um, many, many thanks to Helen and Doug. Doug, so sorry for all of those uh, technical difficulties. And we will see you next time.